Then we have a vaccine milestone. The more Americans have now received at least one dose of the vaccine compared to how many people have contracted the virus. They said that UPS actually delivered 36.5 million doses of the vaccine in the United States. So this is good news for the US. And then on a separate front, we had the World Health Organization officials going into Wuhan, China, to investigate where the actual source of the virus was, right? This is a full one year after the virus started. And there was all of these delays and they actually arrived in January and then the Chinese government held them up for another month after that. So do you really think there's gonna be anything they can find of value in, in China now after a year later when everything has been wiped clean? And I mean, one of the stops they were gonna do was the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This is like the level five bio lab that they have there. Are they really gonna be able to find anything if there was anything at this point? They're also searching animal health facilities in the area. The the markets where food was sold. So that's another thing too. All of this stuff happened with the pandemic and the Chinese never changed the rules on the wet markets where supposedly this virus originated if it wasn't from the lab. So how come this is now the third virus that's come out of these wet markets? You had like the SARS and the other ones before that avian flu. And why are they not making any changes to that? And why isn't there an international community kind of pushing for that as well? And then they also, the World Health organization officials wanted to kind of counter claims from China that China said that the virus came from like imported frozen food, frozen beef or something like that. So they were trying to combat those charges as well. Then you have Canada Goose, the maker of the, you know, the cold gear that's very expensive. They did really well in their quarter and they had strong growth in China. Remember in Southeast Asia, they had that big cold snap this winter. I talked about how it affected natural gas prices. Revenue was 474 million when estimates were only for 415 million right there. So they did pretty well. Then we have some news from CNBC where they were talking about the average American. The average American has $90,000, $90,460 in debt and their average net worth is 748,000. But that's when you take an average and when you have billionaires in that same pool, it kind of skews the numbers. So the Federal Reserve said the median net worth for people between the ages of 35 and 44 is 91,300. And the average net worth is about $436,000. So that gives you a, a bit of a difference. The average is 436 versus the median of 91,000 net worth. eBay, eBay earnings estimates came above expectations by three cents and it was about 0.86 per share. Revenue also did well. The company decided to actually increase their dividend payouts by double digits. So they're actually gonna be increasing it 13% here. That's good news from the company. And on top of that, if that wasn't enough for you guys, they said that they're going to do a share buyback program equal to about $4 billion. So we were talking about how these share buybacks are really coming back in force now. PayPal then, which is also related to eBay and the e-commerce business, they beat earnings estimates by eight cents a share, bringing in $1.08 per share. Revenue beat as well. So you're beating on both earnings and revenue. A lot of these companies sound really good, right? All of these online businesses are, are making a ton of money during the pandemic here. Everybody's shopping online, just like um, Canada Goose even had you know, a record in online sales. Next up, we have Qualcomm had a chip shortage and couldn't meet the expectations for the company. Now, this is a bit of an interesting one. Quarterly sales actually rose 62% from a year earlier to $8.4 billion. Net income doubled to $2.46 billion. You would think that if your profit doubled, that would be pretty good, right? They beat estimates on net income. They barely missed on revenue from the, compared to the estimates. But the problem was is that all these phones, you know, from Apple were selling and everybody thought Qualcomm and all these semiconductors, all these chips would be selling. And it turns out there's now a global semiconductor shortage. They're not able to produce enough. And this is being not just Qualcomm, it's occurring worldwide. And they had to cut their forecasts because of this, because they just can't produce enough. Ford even came out and said that for their produc production of vehicles in 2021, they're gonna cut the production by 20% because they can't get enough of these chips that they need for their vehicles. 
So we talked about before about how the pandemic is affecting supply chains and potential shortages. And this is interesting that we're seeing it in semiconductors of all things is where we're seeing some shortages right now. Then you have Clorox, which came out. They're doing pretty well still because the pandemic is still occurring. Occurring. They had earnings of $2.03 per share, which was, I think it was above estimates by like 25 cents, which is really good. Revenue was also above estimates. So they're still going strong. But more importantly here, from a takeaway perspective, they gave their full year revenue forecast with the expectation that there would be continued elevated sales of all disinfecting products across their product line because of the pandemic. They don't really think this is going to be like vaccines are out and we're done. They think this is going to continue. Merck missed earnings per share by six cents and they came in at $1.32 per share. Revenue was also a little bit below estimates there. And then they also had a big announcement. They're struggling compared to some of these other companies with the vaccines. The CEO, Kenneth Frazier, announced he will be stepping down on June 30th. He's being replaced by the CFO, Robert Davis. So this is another CEO that you have stepping, stepping down. And this is pretty big news here, but it wasn't all negative. They did put out some, some upbeat sales and revenue forecasts for the upcoming quarters. Then you have Costco. E-commerce sales at Costco doubled from a year ago period. Comparable store sales were up 15.9%. All those people running in there to buy all of the toilet paper on the shelves. Double digit growth for same store sales is great. I mean, 5% growth would be great. The estimate was even up to 11.7% for this and they still beat it. Hotels, the share of hotels in the US that are behind on their mortgage payment is up to 18%. Before this whole pandemic started, it was around 2% and it's jumped to 18%. So we're re really seeing the hotel struggling. And we talked about in previous videos how some people are trying to make affordable housing or kind of buy up these properties now. Zoom video communications soared another 41% with their blowout earnings report because everybody and their mom has to be on Zoom, right? So people are just, you know, holding on along for the ride on this one. Then you have Activision Blizzard. With a 24% year-over-year growth in revenue, they had earnings per share of $1.21 versus $1.17 expected. Bobby Kotick said that this was like the best year in their 30-year history. And if you're looking at digital sales of the Call of Duty and the other series, they were up about 40%. So that means that, you know, this is bad news for GameStop where you can buy your local games, right? They have 300 million, Activision Blizzard has 300 million active users. That's pretty crazy right there. World of Warcraft, 29 million people are playing that game. They had a 40% year over year growth for World of Warcraft. Isn't that like 15 years old? Then Candy Crush where people can play on their phones there. That one actually had double digit growth. They have 240 million people playing Candy Crush, which I thought that was like popular, I don't know, five years ago. And it's still going. Just look at all of these video game companies you have. Electronic Arts, Take-Two, even Zynga, which you know I thought was gonna go bankrupt in the day, is still going along and has been doing all right lately. Next up, we have Match Group. So Match Group is the company, they're known for kind of gobbling up all of these dating apps and making it into their, their own one company. They gave weak guidance, causing a sell-off in the stock, but they met their fourth quarter numbers for 2020. Half of the company's revenue now comes from Tinder, which is interesting. Downloads of Hinge, which they also own, increased 82%. The revenue from Hinge was up in the third quarter of 2020 as well. And then they also have a company that they acquired in the Japanese market, which had revenue up from, I think they acquired it in like 2015, and the revenue was also up from that one. And it was about 600% revenue increase in the past five years. And the name of the app was called Pairs. And so it's really big in Japan here. So we're seeing not even just in the standard American and European markets, even in Japan, they were doing well on that. The company is also now looking to get into non-dating apps. And remember, a lot of people give up a lot of information when they're making or signing up for these dating apps. So they're going to help use, utilize that information for other business ventures. Remember, we also have competition coming in from Bumble, which is supposed to have their IPO soon. And when Bumble comes out, you know, that's just one of many other dating apps that people can use. So the company is trying to diversify here. 
Speaking of like what was occurring in Japan there, we also have Sony. Sony said that the profit for the quarter was up 20% and revenue in the gaming division in particular was up 40% year over year. 4.5 million PlayStation 5 consoles have been sold. Remember, that's a new console that just came out. It's competing with the Xbox Model X and it looks like it's been outselling it if you look at some of the numbers that I was seeing. Digital games and add-ons to games were up 65% from a year earlier. They also had the company raise their outlook 34%. That would be 11% year-over-year growth rate that they would be experiencing with that. So even if you know this company's traded on a, a foreign exchange, it's kind of interesting. You can see just in this overall video game market, and you can see even if it's going on in Japan or in other countries, it affects worldwide you know, what's going on and, and the technology as well. So I like to kind of look at all of these different companies from around the world like that. In the US though, we had jobs numbers came out. And in January, only 46, no, 40,000 jobs were created in the month of January. December was upwardly revised to 95,000. So see the difference there. Unemployment rate dropped down from 6.4 to 6.3, which is not really significant. Labor participation rate is still at a very weak 61.4%. The economy has lost about 9.8 million, 9.89 million jobs since before the pandemic that we haven't recouped yet. We did have three straight weeks of less jobless claims here. It was, came out at like 70, 779,000. So that's been on a downward trend, which is good, but it's still a high number. Hey, on top of this, we have the $1.9 trillion stimulus deal coming out. So they have to call it 1.9 trillion because remember two trillion sounds like it's scary. So you can't use that. And you should be getting another, another kind of personal paycheck for $1,600 because we made the $400 paycheck before. So now they have to do the 1600 because a couple months ago, the $2,000 paycheck was too scary as well. So I don't know why the, the politicians are scared of the number two in any of the numbers, but it seems to be the case. I don't know. That's the kind of stuff that drives them. Then we have oil companies struggling very much in 2020. ExxonMobil reported a loss of about $22 billion in 2020. This is the company's first full year loss in 40 years. They still vowed to never cut their dividend here, which is currently at 8%, which is pretty crazy. And this is the, also the first time in history that they've had four consecutive quarters where they had losses. Never happened before for Exxon. For this last quarter though, if you look at the last one, it was like they had a charge of $19 billion that they had to write down. And if you remove that, they would have made a meager profit of 11 million. But still, this is still like, you know, breaking records in a negative sense for them. And the ExxonMobil CEO, Darren W. Woods stated, the past year presented the most challenging market conditions ExxonMobil has ever experienced. I mean, that says it all right there, right? Now, other oil companies are not faring any better. You had BP, Beyond Petroleum, come out with a loss of $18.1 billion per share. Chevron came out and they had a loss of $5.5 billion per share. Now this is, keep in mind, oil just hit a recent one year high of $55 a barrel. So even though these companies were really struggling in 2020 when all of the travel was shut down and factories were closed, maybe now coming into 2021 with the price of oil going up, maybe they would start be able to make a bit of a comeback here. Although they are now on the kind of not the right side of the political spectrum. There's a lot of stuff with climate trying to go against the oil industry. And apparently ExxonMobil and Chevron, Chevron have been in talks since the very start of the pandemic that maybe they should do a merger between those two companies. If this happens, it would be one of the largest mergers that we have in the United States. And the only main competitor to that force that would be created there would be BP. It would be kind of like they're, they're putting back together standard oil here. So that would be interesting to see if they continue those talks and if anything comes out of it. Next up, we have Snap. Snap ended the quarter with 265 million daily active users. They beat expectations of only 257.8 million users. The ending, and I think it was, a, it was 100, no, 16 million users in the quarter they added in the last quarter. This is the most since back in 2016. So people during the pandemic are signing up for these apps. 
And if you look at a statistic that they gave out during the presentation, they said that people open up that app for Snapchat 30 times a day, three zero, 30 times a day. I mean, that's, that's like an addiction, isn't it, right? Revenue was up 62% to 911.3 million, beating estimates of 852.3 million. The stock went up from $52 to $64 this week. Even with this, Snap still reported a loss of $113.1 million or eight cents a share. I guess it is better than last year when they lost 240 million or 17 cents a share, but still, why can't these companies make a profit? Pin interest, end of the year had 459 million monthly active users that beat expectations. Their revenue was up a crazy 76% to 706 millions. They were estimating there was only gonna be 645 and they came in at 706 million. Earnings were $208 million or about 0.43 a share. One estimate was for, I think, 34 cents a share, so they beat right there. So Pinterest, Pinterest, if I say that properly, is, is really doing well here. And I'll, I guess I'll end on that with, you see Snapchat and Pinterest and a lot of these apps with Match, a lot of them were faring pretty well in the pandemic. And we're gonna have to see what happens now going into a period where everything starts opening up, people are allowed to go outside again. And if that changes everything with the online commerce and these apps that are, people are focused at when they don't have anything else to do. This is Andrew with Spark Finance. Thanks for watching. Check out my other videos to keep up to date on business news.